Thomson's experiment deduced the charge to mass ratio of cathode rays. This is a particularly important experiment in the field of physics and chemistry because it proved that cathode rays were particles in nature. It is also the very first experiment that provided evidence for subatomic particles, the electron in particular. Thomson's experiment involved the manipulation of both magnetic and electric fields. This diagram shows a summary of the setup used by Thomson. We'll discuss it in further detail in this video. Thomson's experiment can be broken up in three different parts. The first part involves passing a cathode ray through a tube without the interference of any electric fields or magnetic fields. In the absence of fields, the cathode ray will travel in a straight line, and this can be detected by a fluorescent screen that is placed at the end of the cathode ray tube. In the second part of the experiment, Thomson applied an electric field such that the positive plate is at the top and the negative plate is at the bottom. In the presence of the electric field, the cathode ray's trajectory is deflected towards the positively charged plate. Therefore, by the time it reaches the end of the cathode ray, the position of the fluorescence will shift upwards compared to where it was before, when the electric field was not applied. When the magnetic field is also switched on and applied in such a way so that the resultant force due to the magnetic field acting on the cathode ray is opposite to that of the force due to the electric field, the deflection of the cathode ray can be reversed. Thomson slowly increased the strength of the magnetic field such that the cathode ray's trajectory will return to its original position. In other words, it will travel straight through both fields. This is only possible when the force due to the electric field, which is given by QE, is equal to the magnitude of the force due to the magnetic field, which is given by QVB sine theta. In Thomson's experiment, the angle between the cathode ray and the magnetic field is 90 degrees, which allows us to simplify this equation into E equals to VB. We'll come back to this equation in a moment. In the third part of Thomson's experiment, the electric field that was switched on is now turned off. Now, in the absence of the electric field, the cathode ray only experiences the force due to the magnetic field, and as a result, it's deflected downward. So the position of the cathode ray on the screen is now below the original position where it travelled in a straight line. When only the magnetic field is present, the cathode ray undergoes uniform circular motion, whereby the force due to the magnetic field is providing the important centripetal force. So force due to the magnetic field, which is QVB, is equal to the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r. This simplifies into QB equals to mv over r. In the second part of the experiment, when the cathode ray is able to travel in a straight line through both active electric and magnetic fields, we show that the strength of the electric field is equal to the velocity of the cathode ray multiplied by the strength of the magnetic field. In the last part of the experiment, where only the magnetic field is present, we show that Q times by B is equal to mv over r. Now, from the first part, we can derive an expression for the velocity of the cathode ray, which is E divided by b. And we can substitute this expression into my second equation, qb is equal to m times by e over b divided by r. And by rearranging this equation, I can derive an equation for q over m, which is equal to e divided by b squared r. In Thomson's experiment, since the value of the electric field strength and the magnetic field strength are known, and the radius of the cathode ray in the very last part of the experiment can be measured, Thomson was able to calculate the exact value of the cathode ray's charge to mass ratio. Thomson showed that the charge to mass ratio of cathode rays was constant at the value of 1.76 times 10 to the power of 11. And this value remained consistently the same under various conditions such as when different values of electric field and magnetic fields are being used. The charge to mass ratio also remained the same number regardless of the cathode ray material that was used to produce the cathode ray in the first place. The charge to mass ratio was also compared to that of hydrogen ions. It was shown that it was approximately 1,800 times larger than the charge to mass ratio of hydrogen ions. Thomson assumed that the charge of cathode rays and the hydrogen ions are the same, and as a result proposed that the mass of these cathode ray particles is roughly 1,800 times smaller than that of the hydrogen ion. 
Numerous conclusions can be drawn from the results of Thomson's experiment. Most importantly, Thomson showed that cathode rays has mass by calculating its charge to mass ratio. And as a result, it proved that cathode rays are indeed particles in nature, as opposed to wave in nature. This conclusion settled the debate between the wave and particle nature of cathode rays that arose due to the different experiments involving cathode ray tubes. Thomson's experiment also confirmed that cathode rays are made of negatively charged particles. He also showed that these charged particles are much smaller than hydrogen ions by comparing their charge to mass ratio. And lastly, Thomson concluded that these negatively charged electrons are subatomic particles that are found in all materials, as the charge to mass ratio of cathode rays remained the same number regardless of the type of cathode material that was used in the experiment.